Okay. So, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, I just began the recording, so we're ready to go on the, uh, on recording this uh, lecture. Also, all of these can now be found either through Zoom because these are you can find them in two places. You can go on to your Zoom account for Stockton, check in the recordings there. So if you need transcripts or anything like that, those are all located on the Zoom site. Of course, I take uh, the, the entire video and convert it to a YouTube video, which is then posted uh, originally on PBWorks. Now you'll find them in Blackboard. So uh, the conversion of Blackboard is going a little bit more slowly than I cared to, but some of the things don't, um, they don't convert as easily as others, but I, I'm getting there. I should be done by the end of the week. So everything should be online. I want to uh, take today, and uh, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Don't panic. There we go. Um, I am hoping that what you see is a full page slide. Uh, wait a minute. I still have got to change my setup here. It's interesting that every time you change something, I end up with different defaults. I don't know. But at any rate, uh, what we can do here is I want to talk a little bit about building on the idea of using word clouds as a way of describing text information and talk a little bit about some of the other ways that uh, word clouds can be used. And uh, one of the so one of the things that we'll talk a little bit about are things like word clouds, word trees, and of course mind maps. And so the entire purpose here is to get us thinking about other ways of present other graphical methods of presenting uh in from tech usual textual information uh there are some really interesting things one can do when analyzing text uh using something called a word tree uh, most of you have seen uh word trees in a sense uh, because what you're really doing sorry i'm just moving some things around a little bit there we go okay uh, what these do is they analyze text in a more or less uh, linear fashion. And so, for example, here is one taking uh, out of an entire text, uh, looking at the word dignity. And I don't know why my pen is not writing stuff. It'll probably show up in a minute. There we go. Uh, dignity and in the context of sentences and with a little bit of explanation along the way. So one can create a tree if you want to think about this particular idea of a word tree. Think of it in something that you've seen before in uh, biodiversity and evolution and possibly bioinformatics if you took it, which is really thinking about uh, either pedigrees or phylogenetic trees. Only this is taking textual information and putting them in that same context. And in fact, it's actually the identical uh, software that allows you to do text analysis uh, that allows you to go ahead and do phylogenetic trees. Uh, these are all, uh, there's another one here. Uh, this is something called PhraseNet, which develops semantic combinations of words. And in fact, in this idea, they take individual words, the size of the word is indicated just like a word cloud, the size of the word is the frequency inside a text. And then the lines that connect the text, you can define what each line means. So is it an and, is it a V, or is it an at? And you could use different size, different color lines, different types of lines to indicate um, the relationships among and between 
words. So this is really kind of a cool way. You could actually use all sorts of different phrases here. You can evaluate all sorts of different kinds of texts. And um, uh, unfortunately, we're going to actually skip over doing these analyses, but I want you to know that they're available to you. Uh, and actually, you can create your own account on IBM's Watson computer, the same one that won Jeopardy. And all of these analyses are available on Watson. And in fact, they have quite a few genome, genome analysis tools as well. Uh, it is just too much trouble between people who have Macs and PCs to be able to actually access all of this software. Uh, but I do want you to know this is another way that one can consider uh, looking at connections among in between words, among in between concepts. Uh, here is an advantage. Here's an example right out of the IBM. Uh, and you can kind of add the IBM Watson computer. And you can see how all these, you can define how all these different words are connected, and then it'll turn around and draw your very own, what they call a phrase net. So you can actually do these kinds of connections. Uh, there's, there's some really fun things you can do. You can actually take, for example, a chapter uh, of an online biology text and actually analyze it by phrase net. It gives you some really interesting pictures. Again, different ways of evaluating information. Uh, where I'd like to focus today, okay, this is just, uh, unfortunately, you can see in here, I guess I decided to write it myself. Uh, we, we actually can't do this. Uh, at least in the IBM Watson. Uh, it turns out that the package that used to do this in R is no longer supported in the new version of R. So we actually can't do this this semester, but want you to know it's available and you can do it if you cannot get access to IBM's Watson. If anybody's more interested in that, I'll show you how to get an account separately uh, and uh, if you'd like to try something like this at some point, but it's kind of cool. So what I really want to get at today to focus on is thinking of more in terms of graphical representation, because that's really what we're trying to get at here, uh, is finding ways to take information that we usually consider being linear. And this is really a problem that we have uh, in the sciences, is that we train you guys very, very specifically to think in linear fashion. We think about how you get presented information. You get a textbook. How do you read a textbook? In order of chapters, in order of pages, okay? So it's always along a specific timeline. All right. Think about the way you watch movies. I think think about the way you watch movies. How are movies presented? They're presented usually in terms of time, in terms of scenes, in terms of chapters. And we begin to see how these are presented either in the course of character development, character growth very often. Uh, and everything is always linear. There's an x-axis that's usually time. And then there's a y-axis that has to do with, depending upon the kind of information, you've got some kind of a phenotypic event that occurs over time. And so I'm mixing and matching text-based information with some very specific biological terminology now, because we're going to make the conversion into thinking about biology very quickly. Uh, if you want to stick with the movie analogy a little bit, uh, think about some of the movies that you may have seen that are interesting in part because they violate the assumptions of linearity. Anybody ever see the show on TV, uh, This Is Us? 
nobody to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. You don't have to turn on your camera. It's just so, okay, this is us. It's a story about a family. And in the first few issues, uh, first few issues, God, I'm thinking comic books, sorry. <laughs> in the first few episodes, you really don't realize that the characters are the same characters, but presented in brief scenes where they are in different ages in their life. So you see kind of early on, you see parents with new babies. And then sometime later on, you see brothers and sisters, but they're adults. And it takes a few episodes of watching the show to realize that the adults that you're watching are the same people as the babies. It's just all presented out of sequence. And so this nonlinearity creates an interesting sense of contrast and anticipation in the mind of the viewer because you're wondering what happened between here and here, okay? Uh, there are a handful of movies that are presented like that. I'm trying to think. I just blocked on the name of the movie that's actually filmed backwards from the ending to the beginning and is filmed in a series of scenes. Oh, somebody help me. There must be some movie. Anybody watch it? It's not Vertigo. Not Echo. Wasn't the Curious Case of Benjamin Button one of them? Curious Case of Benjamin Button is a classic one because one character in the story goes backwards in time. He starts out old and becomes basically uh, very young by the end of this movie. It was or the, the Time Traveler's Wife, I think. Time too. Traveler's Wife, again, yeah. overlapping time frames. Okay. Uh, there was a great, oh, God. I'll send you a link to it because it, I know the minute I turn the recording off, I'll think of it. But there's a great movie uh, where it's actually told backwards. The entire movie is backwards. And so it and it's really interesting the way it makes your mind think about it. And why do we do this? Why do we think this way? And the answer is when we think about any topic in linear fashion, this is perfect for what, what are considered to be lower levels of learning. What do I mean by lower levels of learning? I mean memorization. It's easy to memorize things in a sequence. Okay? It's easy to turn pages in a textbook and say, well, if A, then B. Right? Uh, I always, but it's this training of our minds in to deal with linear processes that I think really inhibits us from thinking of more complex relationships among and between uh, phenomena. And in biology, it turns out that this is extremely important because we, we have already teased apart a lot of the basic building blocks of biology. We know about cells, we know about molecules, we know the different macromolecules of life. We've defined central dogma. So we know all the bits and pieces. We kind of have all the nuts and bolts. But how do they become assembled to describe organs, organ systems? How do they interact with one another? How do populations, different species living within the same ecological niche, how do they interact with one another? How do the different ecological niches interact to create the world we live in? So we have these very, very complex processes that are multidimensional in nature. One of my favorite examples of why it is so important to think multidimensionally is comparing two different types of geometries. And it's really applicable here. Uh, you are all familiar, everybody took geometry back when you were in probably 10th or 11th grade. Okay, in order to get here, you had to take geometry, right? And what did you learn about geometry? Really, oops.
Sometimes you learn curves, right? You learn lines, you learn your x-axis, you learn your y-axis. What did you think about Euclidean geometry? What you really thought about were things that exist in a plane, not in an airplane, but on a flat two-dimensional space, right? Everybody learned this, all right? So what's one of the rules, one of the hard and fast rules about Euclidean geometry? And I'll give you the example right here. Excuse my lack of a straight line. What's that? By the way, I have no chat, so I'll leave it up to you to either yell out or type out. I'm sure you all know what this is. What is it? What did I just draw? Triangle. Was not a trick question. I'll warn you before I do one of those. All right? It's a triangle. What are the rules about a triangle? How do you know it's a triangle? What is it that defines it as a triangle? It has three sides. Right, three lines, right? Three inter intersecting lines, right? Because we could certainly create something that has three lines or three sides, but we wouldn't call that a triangle, right? So a triangle has three sides, three intersecting sides. Cool. What else? What is derived from that idea that it has three lines? What does it also have as a result of having three lines? It has three angles under 180 degrees. It has three angles. And the rule is A plus B plus C has to be right? Everybody remember this? We're dredging up the past. Who knew there'd be a test? So I have a question. Can anybody draw a triangle with that has three angles where A plus B plus C, that's the measurement of the angle, is greater than 180 degrees? Remember that 180 is degrees. Can you draw a triangle with more than 180 degrees? No. Okay. Why do you say that? If you had a triangle, like that one angle was 180 degrees, it would just be a line. Oh, ah, okay. What if you had two right angles, two angles of 90 degrees? the lines wouldn't intersect, so you wouldn't get that third angle. Right, like this little one I drew here, right? Remember, that's a symbol for a right angle, so 90, 90 is 180. So these two lines are parallel, would never meet, so you'd never have three intersecting lines. So we can all kind of agree that you cannot draw you cannot draw a triangle with greater than with angles A plus B plus C greater than 180 degrees. That was true up until the 1930s when Riemann. completely overturned the world of mathematics. And he basically said, oh, and guess what? Ah, 
I'm missing my prop. He basically said, what if instead of drawing the triangle on a plane, what if we drew a triangle on a sphere? So instead of being on a plane, we drew it on a sphere. And if you go home and take a basketball or any kind of ball, cue ball, whatever, and you go to draw a triangle on it, you can draw a triangle that begins here as right angles. And then what happens to the lines? As they move up the ball, they curve and they intersect. And so you can have a triangle with greater than 180 degrees in all three angles. And the requirement that A plus B plus C can be 180 degrees is dictated by the fact that Euclidean geometries occurred on a plane and not a three-dimensional sur surface. If anybody thinks that this is just a mathematical trick or irregularity, think about what is the shortest distance between LA and New York City. If you were to fly from LA to New York City, is the shortest distance a straight line? And the answer is no, because if you were to look sideways, that straight line, well, first of all, by the time you got to Ohio, you'd be about uh, three or 400 yards underground. You cannot go in a straight line between LA and New York City because the curvature of the earth, okay? And as a result, the shortest distance between L.A. and New York City is actually an arc. Come on, there we go. Is actually an arc that goes north. Because the arc covers a spot where the diameter of the Earth is lower than here at this point. And you can see that because as the Earth curves, the distance here is greater than the distance up above. So the arc itself is the shortest distance. Now, it even has greater importance when we think about physics and physical particles because it was Ramanian geometry that allowed Einstein to put together his entire idea of the existence of the universe and talking about how the different particles interact with one another on a very small scale, but at the same time, how the universe is organized. So it's a really exciting area of mathematics. And the whole point is the minute you turn our geometry from thinking about it in terms of two dimensions to three dimensions, everything changes. And by the way, everything changes depending upon what kind of a shape. What if we, oops, what if we, instead of Instead of a sphere, what if we took a cone and looked at how geometries change if we existed in a cone? So the size of the three-dimensional object matters in terms of defining the relationships. So this is really the point we're getting at by being able to describe relationships among and between ideas in multiple dimensions, 
it allows us to identify new sets of characteristics of the system that we were completely unable to visualize or to understand when we think of it only in two dimensions. One of the ways that has become very popular to look at this is something called mind maps. Uh, mind maps were actually, the, the name mind map was actually put together by a guy named Tony Buzan. Uh, Tony Buzan was a pop psychologist in the 60s who basically tried to expand people's mental views and their psychology beyond what they existed. And he thought that writing text in linear fashion did not reflect people's mental conditions uh, and that one could understand things better by putting, the, putting ideas together as pictures. He wasn't really the first one to do this. Uh, graphical methods of putting together information date back actually to the third century uh, and in fact were very, very popular uh, during the Renaissance where people were constantly putting things together in terms of paintings and or drawings. And so we can visualize information using outlines, very popular. Mind mapping is the one we're gonna talk about briefly. Uh, and this is the concept of taking what might be a traditional outline, but instead of presenting it in linear order, okay, everybody knows the outline. You start with category one, and then you've got one A, and then you've got one capital letter A, uh, smaller letter A, numerical with a parenthesis, there are all sorts of different types of outlines one can create, but they're fundamentally linear. Or with mind maps, you can create a radial tree style of organization. And this is kind of a classic mind map. We'll see what these look like in just a moment. And thanks to Tony Buzan, instead of just arbitrarily writing words, we use bright colors, shapes, connecting lines. And the idea is to stimulate other parts of your brain to make the concepts easier to remember and therefore have better learning. And people have been showing time and time again that mind mapping, that is graphical organization of information, helps you to learn things. I've had a number of students, uh, after having addressing this concept, say that this has really helped them to study for everything from classes here at Stockton to getting ready for the MedCats. <laughs> because they, their ability to remember and understand relationships was so much better having used mind maps. Uh, I know that, um, I know that uh, those of you who had uh, Mr. Fergioni uh, in either bio one or bio two, he uses mind maps a lot. Uh, I don't know who else does, but I did notice that in the genetics textbook this year, they're actually presenting genetic concepts and they're giving the option of using mind maps in the genetic textbooks as well. So we're beginning to see more and more of the application of mind maps in higher education. Next to mind maps, the next more complicated concept are these concept maps. And these, rather than having a single central idea, these have one or more ideas, and I like to think of this as connecting among and between mind maps. So you're actually connecting multiple mind maps and showing relationships among and between central ideas, especially if those central ideas have overlapping components. And finally, the most complex of these graphical analyses are just what are simply termed modeling graphs. Uh, and these are very, very specific types of interactions in which the structured relationships are defined by visual elements that are clearly defined. That is, they have mathematical meaning. And we'll look at the, those probably in a week or two 
We'll look at some biochemical metabolic networks in which all the visual elements are very, very clearly defined and have meaning. And the minute that has, takes on effect, the shape of the network, the shape of the picture actually begins to take on some unique aspects and unique interpretations. Uh, here are some classic ones. Uh, you don't necessarily need a computer to actually create uh, any kind of a mind map. Uh, here is a central idea of feeding relationships and notice the radial view of feeding relationships looking at it in terms of the more global ecological point of view uh, as well as plants and relationship uh, plants and animals are they necessarily consumers or producers? And exactly what do they consume? You can also begin to see, like for example, and just to give you a brief example, if we look at animals or consumers, herbivores eat plants. I might have said something along these lines. Let's make a connecting line between herbivores and plants because that's actually what they eat. So you might make a different colored line or a dotted line. Uh, indicating consumption versus production. So there are ways to construct these informations and connect them so that each graphical element has meaning, has meaning. So this would be really a handy way to do this. You don't necessarily uh, have to draw them by hand. We can use computers uh, recently uh, we've seen quite a bit of use of the idea of a mind map in biochemistry. Here is an example from a recent paper looking at the effect of iron, metaboli and iron metabolism on the citric acid cycle, and they were using a drug that interfered with iron, and so you could see the effect that the drug by interfering with iron metabolism has at each step of the citric acid cycle. So this is really kind of a very, very clever way to make a presentation that's easier to understand than if you just had a group of five charts in a table on in a biochemistry paper. So this becomes a really handy way because everybody who's ever had a biochemistry course knows the citric acid cycle. So it becomes very easy in your mind to place each of the individual components and what it means to the overall cycle by creating a graphical element. Nice. Uh, I love this one. Uh, this is a great example uh, from a recent online. Uh, this is for a board certification. It's an online textbook for board certification uh, in surgery. And you can kind of see they're talking here about the cubital fossa in the joint. And it talks about organizing the information within the arm in a very regular series and makes it very easy to memorize when going in for your medical boards. And there are a lot of these, uh, especially in medicine, these are really heavily used when trying to show relationships among and between structures and disease. And you could see where it kind of talks about uh, everything from the gross physical structure all the way down to very specific physiological concomitants. So really kind of a cool way to study and incorporate multiple types of information 
in a single graphic. So uh, I will say that the uh, medical schools have been uniquely adapting a lot of very modern educational techniques once you get to medical school. Uh, I will say that we've probably done not as good a job at the university level of incorporating some of the learning uh, techniques and educational techniques where medical schools have excelled. Uh, one of them, of course, is the use of mind maps to in integrate information between anatomy, physiology, and disease. They've done an excellent job in this regard. Uh, they also tend to use uh, discovery-related education as opposed to here, read a couple chapters of the textbook and tell us what you think about kidneys. They'll actually teach renal physiology by presenting a group of students with a disease state in, of the kidney and say, okay, here's the disease state. Now let's, here you go off on your own with usually with a team of students and you go off on your own and find out everything you can to explain the disease state and what the treatment might be. So this idea of a course-based research has really taken over in the medical schools and is really great uh, in the sense that it really t focuses on critical thinking. It's a really good thing. I wish we did more of it here. Uh, here's one that you may be a little bit more familiar with. Uh, we can see uh, we've got our handy dandy tree base diagram here. You've probably seen this before uh, in the Biodiversity and Evolution Handbook. And it shows you the relationships among and between the different species, uh, looking at their phylogenetic relationships, but also realizing that the length of these lines are indicative of time frame to a common ancestor. So here's a spot where we see an indication, a very clear definition of the meaning for the connecting lines. And then just because it matched up, here is a lovely study, uh, more tree oriented than perhaps radially organized of concepts of biological evolution. Although we can see pretty clearly in here, uh, I probably would have altered these a little bit, but this is from an undergraduate biology text uh, where it's looking at mechanisms of evolution and talking about mutation, recombination, gene flow or drift or founder effect, non-genetic and phenotypic plasticity. I might have organized them differently, but that's okay. That's the point of putting these together is to allow you to uh, be able to think about the relationships among and between the ideas. I'll show you one more. I absolutely love this one. Uh, this is actually another one uh, from a commercial uh, online source. Uh, this is fantastic because it combines anatomical drawings with functional aspects, interactions among and between the different types of epithelia. So again, we're getting down from the gross anatomical level to the microanatomical level to actually talking about the mechanisms of vision. Uh, there is another one of these that talks about diseases of the eye and basically takes this uh, and pulls it apart and talks about diseases in each of these different combinations. So this is really a beautiful one. Uh, the reason that there's a watermark across it is because this is only a sample and I cut and pasted the sample. You're actually not allowed to download it. You have to pay for it. So if you go to this website, uh, you can actually pay for it. And the reason the disease one is not here is because they won't even let you see a picture of it. You've got to actually pay for it 
which I'm not doing. I just want to show you what's possible. So how do we go about creating these mind maps? And of course, this is really getting down to it, is we want to think about what kinds of software we can use to create mind maps. Uh, one of the top ones that's used very frequently uh, is MindMeister. And I'm going to show you some examples from these in a little bit. Uh, we've used MindMeister in the class before. Uh, MindMeister does a very good job. It's web-based, so it will work on any of your computers. Uh, and there's a link here which I will also provide on Blackboard for you if you'd like to use it. Uh, there is Coggle, which last year we used Coggle. It seemed that the students tried a few different types and they found Coggle to be the easiest to use. Uh, I do not have a, uh, I don't have a dog in the fight. It doesn't matter to me what you use to create a mind map. Uh, but MindMeister is very good. Coggle is very good. Uh, I use the brain, uh, which is something that I use for my consulting business. So uh, nobody here at Stockton pays for it. I think it's the best available, and I'll show you why in just a little bit, it, where it is either locally installed or web-based. Uh, it is written in Java. So it works on any platform, as long as you can load Java on your computer. So it works on Windows, Macs, or Unix computers, uh, but it is expensive. And you'll see why it's expensive in just a moment. And of the final one, and I do like this, and I use this on occasion, although since I started buying, since I have a license now for the brain, I tend to use the brain. Uh, but another one is something called FreeMind. Uh, FreeMind is also written in Java. It is a downloadable program, so it is not web-based. It is installed locally in Java. The link is here. Uh, it is open source, and you can always tell it's open source because it is located at sourceforge.net, a uh, software that you download on sourceforge.net is guaranteed to be free of worms and viruses and trackers. So uh, SourceForge is a great place to get software that you may be interested in using. Uh, it works on any operating system. And of course, because it is open source, guess what? It is my favorite. It is free. Free, free, free. That's my favorite. And in fact, this uh, over here, the a mind map about time management systems is actually located online, an example of something you can do with FreeMind. So it's very cartoony, uh, but it's cartoony, but created by a software program. So it gives you a little bit of uh, background. Now I do want to, uh, I put this little note down here at the bottom because I emphasize the concept of multidimensionality. And yet in reality, even though we've eliminated ourselves from the lit, we've kind of, uh, excuse me, even though we've freed ourselves from the linearity of the XY axis, <laughs> we are still two dimensional. We are still two dimensional. So you could very well ask, doesn't this restrict and change our feeling as well? And the answer is absolutely. It does change the way we view things. So what about really taking the next step and going to truly multidimensional mapping systems? And the answer is we will, but we're gonna take little baby steps. So let me show you some examples because the whole point of this is getting us to where you can begin the production of a mind map. I cannot find my zoom. There it is. For, don't worry about the Zoom meeting, but rather 
for a topic that you might be interested in, something in biology. Okay, this is the bulk of the grading of this course, is getting us to the point where you can use the tools that we're working with to create graphical representations of some biological process that you have interest in. That's a really hard thing to ask, and that's why this is a 4,000 level course because sometimes the hardest thing to ask is to ask you to identify something that you really are interested enough in to do research on your own, to look up references, to look up ideas, and then to put them into a coherent model to present to other people as to what you learned why it's interesting, and what does the new method of communicating this information do to perhaps create new ideas for yourself? So just to give you some idea, I'm going to show you a few of these that were created by students here in the past. Uh, right now, all of these Mind maps are available on PB works. I'm in the process of converting them into uh, individual graphic images. Uh, all of these were used, uh, were created rather using the Coggle software program. And notice that this was uh, put together by one of the one of the students who was really interested in looking at strokes. They had experience with strokes and they were trying to put together information about causes and effects of strokes. And this is a really nicely done uh, mind map looking at two different types of stroke, hemorrhagic and ischemic, putting together in the different colors, putting together the physiological as well as the disease outcomes and the different biochemical processes that are involved in stroke. And you can kind of really get a sense as you read through this, the relationships among and between. And at this point, they were actually drawing connecting lines among and between the anatomical, the physiological, physiological and the biochemical. So really a great representation of stroke. Another student was interested in putting together a uh, background on alcoholism and alcohol metabolism. And you can kind of get a sense of their, be this is only the beginning of their mind map to put it together, talking about uh, both the pharmacokinetics as well as the molecular pools of what happens in vitro with alcohol and how it's metabolized. Uh, they were in the process of actually designing a study uh, where they were going to simulate uh, comparisons in alcohol metabolisms between alcoholics and non-alcoholics, uh, where they were given uh, different levels of alcohol, where they could drink but be sober, drink but get drunk. Uh, we did point out to them, obviously, there are some ethical issues with giving a known alcoholic uh, alcohol to drink till they get drunk. Uh, however, the kind, it was a thought experiment. Nobody really thought they were, this was going to be done at any point in time. Another topic of interest was osteoporosis. And you could see how detailed, very nice looking at bone formation from a developmental point of view, re bone remodeling after injury, as well as the effects of estrogen and notice their interconnections among and between the different types. And they're all in here, uh, endocrine system. Uh, this was a really interesting uh, look at causes and effects of Alzheimer's. 
everything ranging from gross changes in psychology all the way down to individual biochemical components that were identified in um, in these individuals in Alzheimer patients. Uh, here is uh, this is just oh, so all of these that I've showed you and shared here are from Coggle. Uh, MindMeister is a very, very popular one. I think it's more powerful than Coggle. Uh, I don't have any in here right now, other than if you wanted to take a look at uh, how I was trying to diagnose an overheating problem in my truck. So you can kind of see uh, what I had begun to look at. Of course, I have since replaced the water pump, the thermostat and all the hoses in the truck, and it no longer overheats. So I'm not sure this actually did any good, but it was nice for organizing my thoughts. So this was a, just, a, just a sample I did. I don't have any biological examples here, but it does make, I think the graphics are a lot, a lot more interesting, I think, than on Coggle. Uh, I do want to show you the brain. Uh, I said the brain is one of my favorites. Uh, I really, really like the brain. I'm not suggesting you should use this. Uh, there is a free version, I, th I think it's still free. Uh, I pay for this, so I have a license for using the brain. And one of the reasons that it is so nice to use is even though we are radi radially organized, notice we are, tr we are getting to the point where it's multidimensional. So this is for an experiment I have about a chemical molecule that we have extracted from cranberries that inhibits adhesion of bacteria to eukaryotic cell membranes. So we think that this particular molecule turns out it's a peptide. This peptide can inhibit infection because it stops bacteria, pathogenic bacteria from attaching to the eukaryotic cell membrane. And so here's the experiment. And in fact, this is always great fun. It allows you to look at the relationships among the ideas from different perspectives. And so you could actually expand and contract all of the different ideas and actually create a, each idea can be a different central tenet of the tree. Uh, the other advantage is that you can actually attach files. So I can attach all of the information for Cyber Green, for DAPI, for YoPro. These are all fluorescent tags. And in fact, I can even put methods and materials as Microsoft Word documents or Excel spreadsheets into this. So this is a really powerful, powerful system that can be used in a lot of different ways. And uh, I like this one quite a bit. Uh, and it's available. I'm pretty sure there's a free one available that you can use. But the free one is very limiting. I think you can only create one mind map. And uh, of course, it becomes very difficult to export this because how can you export the picture if the picture is constantly moving? So, but I like it quite a bit because of its multi dimensional structure. So, that kind of covers where I wanted to go today introduce the topic of mind map. And what I'd like you to do is to think over the next week. So do next week. I would like you to come up with an idea for a project where you can use some of the techniques we've talked about and will talk about over the next several weeks where you can focus some of these ideas and begin to present graphically uh, the general concepts, eventually ending up in a presentation because that's the end of our class. The, the end is for you to make a presentation to everybody else online 
and we'll talk more about those details as we get a little bit closer to it. But meanwhile, I want you to come up with a topic and a generic mind map and a generic mind map, central topic, and maybe a couple of directions that you're interested in. It does not have to be compl as complete. Remember, these are end products that I'm showing you. It does not have to be as complete as these are right now, but a direction you are interested in going. It can be any aspect of biology. Uh, I've had people in the past do ecological relationships. I've had people do biochemical models. Uh, obviously, these were mostly biomedical and looking at physiological concomitants of certain diseases, but it also could be genetic. It can be anything you want. And of course, I think that's what does make it a little bit hard. You have to think very broadly uh, about what you're actually interested in and want to spend the remainder of the semester thinking about and researching. So that's where we are. I'm going to go ahead and stop, give you a chance to, uh, oh, perfect timing, one hour. We're in good shape. Well, cross your fingers, we don't get any snow. <laughs> we may be due for some in the next day or two. And if we're good, anybody got any questions, answers? I do. What's up? Um, well, it's it's not pertaining to class today. It's about extra help. Oh, okay. Well, do you still want to get together, Cass? Yeah. Um, are you available around six o'clock on Thursday? I sent you an email, but um, I figured this was faster. Oh, okay. I, I haven't looked at my email, although I see the little envelope at the bottom of my screen. Um, I may be at the gym. Can you do it earlier? Like five? Uh, five is better. Okay. So we just meet on the Zoom? Yep, I'll send you a, I'll send you an invitation to a Zoom meeting. Okay, thank you. All right. All right, everybody. Take care. Talk to you later.